You're about to join Jerry Parker, Marit Siebert, and Niels Kostrup-Larsen on their raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. Welcome or welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Mark Resensinski and I, Niels Kastel Larsen, where each week we take the pulse of the global markets through the lens of a rules-based investor. Now, for those of you who are regular listeners, our conversations are intended to give you as much of the nurture and encouragement as the turtles got in the mid-1980s, as Jerry likes to put it. And if you are new to the show, we hope that today's episode will trigger your curiosity uh, to learn more by diving into the back catalog and listen to all of the past episodes that you may have missed, like last week's episode, which was with Jerry, which I think was one of the best we have done together, actually. Uh, it was very deep. We went into a number of topics. And of course, Jerry talked about who is likely to be his successor when it's time for him to hang up his boots. So, if you missed that one, I do invite you to go back and listen to it. And uh, as Jerry do, he uh, actually re-listened a couple of times to uh, get all the nuances uh, of what we discussed. Now, Mark, it's great to uh, be with you this week. How are you doing and um, what's going on where you are today? Good. The fall is starting and uh, I, I could feel that there's a certain amount of tension a rum among investors because they've they're done with all their vacation they're done with all their golf labor day in the united states is through so so that means that everybody is now figuring out what am i going to do to set up for the end of the year and and so if you're a poor manager right now i think that you're under scrutiny from investors and if you're a good manager you might see bigger allocations but surprisingly everyone sort of talks about the end of the year effect but the end of the year is actually set up after Labor Day. And and so the timing of when money flows is not on December 31st. So there aren't a lot of people sort of pressing buttons and putting m new mandates out for Jan 1. It usually is starting to occur right now. Interesting that you should mention it, uh, Mark, because I think what people, and I've teased this a little bit in, the, uh, in, in last week's episode, you and I are going to talk about something today which we haven't really discussed on the podcast before. I think it's a fascinating topic and um, it is in fact to do with, you know, what goes into selecting managers and, and also actually how managers look at investors and all that good stuff. So we'll get to that in, in a few minutes, but uh, yes, I think this will be something incredibly useful uh, for everyone listening in today. Now, before I dive into my usual rundown, I want to acknowledge, of course, and give a shout out to those of you who left a rating and review this week. As you know, we so appreciate this. And if I could come with a small ask this week of those of you who enjoy the podcast uh, every week, I would like to ask if you could take a few minutes this week to share the podcast with three of your like-minded friends, as I'm convinced, and that's the best way for us to grow our community uh, by doing it together. And there's no better way than to uh, have someone like a, a listener uh, introducing the podcast to a friend, a colleague, or a family member, and um, who also, of course, should have an interest in finance and investing, uh, and, and therefore our content hopefully will be relevant for them. So in advance, let me say thank you for taking time out to share the podcast with three people this week and to make it super easy for you. I've actually created a link called uh, toptradersunplugged.com forward slash share. And uh, if you share this link with your friends, it actually gives them direct access to all the popular podcast players uh, in a one click so they can choose what works best for them. So thank you in advance for doing that. So with that said, let me just dive into this week's um, quick review. Uh, the Bears had the last we uh, word this week. Stocks came for sale with the S&P 500 dropping about 1% on Friday to extend a whopping, in quotations, of course, 2.3% pullback from its high early in the month. While the NASDAQ, NASDAQ 100, it lost about 1.2% to record the worst one-day showing since May. U.S. bonds 
were also under pressure uh, with the 10-year yield rising towards its 200-day moving average, which is around 1.37%. WTI crude oil slipped below $72 and gold remained weak at around $17.50 an ounce. The VIX rose 10% to uh, about 21 making it's, uh, it the first back-to-back weekly close above 20 since March of this year. Now, economic data this week offered something for everyone, I would say. For those seeing the uptick in inflation as transitory, uh, well, the consumer price index data was not as bad as feared. The month-over-month CPI fell from 0.5% in July to 0.3% in August, arguably an improving trend, but still rising at an above-target pace. The year-over-year rate also improved, marginally falling from 5.4% to in July to 5.3% in August. Again, it's the right direction, but still pretty alarmingly high numbers. Looking into next week, the FOMC will release their rate decision on Wednesday afternoon. All eyes, of course, will be focusing on tapering. While several members have been publicly vocal about commencing sooner rather than later, it's possible that they will push the decision out for another month. Now, Mark, let me just bring you in here to touch on what are the things that may have caught your attention from a big picture point of view, markets, whatever it might be, since uh, we last spoke a few weeks ago. Well, the big issue is, is the fact that we're hitting tops in uh, in the equity market. So 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 we're at at sort of market extremes. But I think that we're building up a lot of pressure to, of what we're going to see at the end of the year. And what we're going to see at the end of the year is whether there's going to be tapering or not, whether there's going to be a continued rebound in, in equity markets, what's going to be happening in China. So I think that right now we're, we're in a wait and see period. And you could see that in in a market directional move. Yeah, no, I agree. And actually, there's quite a few things going on from a big picture point of view. You mentioned China, and that's certainly one of the things that I think people need to uh, pay attention to. In terms of uh, our performance, the overall, we saw a small improvement in our trend-following strategies in the past week, despite the last two days of corrections in a number of trends. The performance on our side was largely split between equities and copper, uh, suffering losses this week, whilst we had energies and grains contributing positively. Fixed income also did okay with short-term interest rates in the UK, so that's the short sterling contract taking the title for the best performing market for the week. Currency sector was mixed for us, and overall it was a pretty flat sector return we saw there. My trend barometer finished the week yet again at a week level, 36. So, not quite agreeing with what's going on when we get to the industry numbers, but certainly more in line with what we've seen over the summer at our firm. In terms of volatility, Friday was the monthly, and this week we actually saw the quarterly option expiration, as this has been one of the largest expirations by open interest during the last two years. The amount of hedging flows were pretty large which also is one of the explanations for the quick reversals after small dips during the week, albeit less so on Friday as the options expired in the morning. The VIX term structure flattened in the front end while remaining unchanged for the longer dated expirations. All of the weekly actions originated really Friday afternoon, a pattern that has also been seen and repeated itself for a while now. Friday also showed us how nervous the markets uh, really are as the front month VIX uh, increased by 1.4%, which is about one and a half times what the S&P declined in terms of percentage. All in all, on our side, the volatility strategy was pretty uneventful week, really, with the exception of Friday, maybe. But again, you know, about three-tenths of 1% for the week. On my trend-following portfolio side, where, of course, I can go into more detail, it was a negative week pretty much mainly due to Friday's action, uh, I will say. So it leaves it down almost 3%, 2.99 for the month, uh, still up six and a quarter or 6.28 for the year so far. Performance as it breaks down between the three groups, uh, group one, classical trend down 1.13 for the month, group two, long biased uh, trend following uh, down 83 basis points, and group three, which are the fast reacting models, they're down about 1.03%. Top three markets so far this month, 
or sectors, I should say, is uh, base metals, energies, and a little bit of profit in precious metals. And the worst sectors this month really are equities, bonds, currencies, and short-term interest rates uh, come in almost you know, tied on third place. And if we drill down by markets, um, the, um, the top performers are aluminum, natural gas, Nikkei. So not surprising if you look at the charts. And at the bottom, we find um, kind of an equity, equity theme, DAX, SMI, and NASDAQ are the, are the worst performers. In terms of the trading this week, not a lot went on. The week started out with the model uh, entering a short signal in live cattle. Then Tuesday, it exited a long German Bund position. On Wednesday, it went long a couple of gas, oil, and heating oil signals and took some profits in a long SMI position, so went out of that. Thursday, it took a short signal in gold, and Friday was uh, mostly about the DAX, so the shorter-term models where there were some long exits uh, and also a long exit in the U.S. 10-year note as they came off. And uh, the risk to stop meaning that if everything got stopped out on Monday, what is the expected loss in the portfolio? It's uh, sitting at 8.4%, which is up fractionally from last week, 8.13%. So pretty much unchanged during the week. That's about it. Now we need to dive into um, a question we got in from uh, Brett. It's a little bit of a long question, but actually it uh, it's pretty interesting. So let's try and deal with that together, Mark, before we dive into this wonderful study that you have been part of. So Brett writes, I wanted to start by thanking you for all that you're doing in terms of educating the public on trend following and rules-based investing. Since finding your podcast back in April of last year, I've continued to educate myself and think more in probabilities with my trading while adhering to risk management principles in my trading systems. So thank you so much for that and for giving me the inspiration to explore further. You're very welcome, Brett. My question will be a little long, so I just want to explain my thoughts. Feel free to edit it. And the question deals with risk bucketing and how you think about it. Okay. As correlations are non-linear and constantly evolve. Some trend followers probably disregard them, whereas others might look at them and how their portfolios behave as a whole. Do you group your contracts positions into risk buckets, such as commodities, currencies, equities, rates? And you could even split the commodities into soft metals, energies, and give a max exposure to each bucket. So that's question number one. Let me just answer it from my perspective, Mark, then you can give your thoughts on, on this. So so actually, uh, you could say I, I, I'm kind of in, in two camps here. So on the done side, we actually want to treat all markets equal, meaning we, uh, although we can see what exposure we have in, 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 in each sector, we actually let the risk exposure be determined on the market level. So you could say there's no specific sector limit the limit is made up by the limits uh, for each of the markets. But in general, we want to treat everything the same because we don't know where the next big trend is going to be. Now, we do take into consideration correlations, though, but that we do more on the overall risk budgets that we have for the full portfolio. So, so yes, we take it into account, but maybe not in the way you describe it just here. For my own trend-following portfolio, I actually don't look at correlations at all. So I just purely look at market by market, similar to, I think, what, you know, Jerry and Moritz do in the sense that we just take, we, we've constructed our portfolio, not based on correlations per se, we are aware of them, but we basically say, okay, we want to trade these markets. And therefore, when we get a signal, we just treat that signal in isolation. We take our, uh, whatever, 25 or 30 or 50 basis points risk and we don't change the position based on changes in correlation or anything like that. So that's kind of how, where where I am. Mark, what what are your thoughts on on this thing about uh, whether you should split your portfolio up in sectors and having risk for that bucket, or whether you should look at markets individually, right. or something in between? I think that most people, and myself included, would use a hybrid approach. And a perfect example is let's look at the energy complex. Uh, so. You have crude oil, you'll have gas oil, uh, you'll have heating oil, uh, RBOB, which is gasoline, 
those are going to be all highly correlated. And what happens is, is that they'll often trend together. And so in some sense, you may want to cap the maximum exposure you have as a group. At the same time, you'd sort of say natural gas. Natural gas is, you could be considered by name part of the energy complex, but natural gas at the same time seems to behave differently. So in that sense is that grouping by name is not appropriate. Grouping by historic correlation tells you what your maximum exposure would be. At the same time, this is that you'd say you could have things that are highly correlated. So you get two markets that have a high correlation, but when you put it through your trend following model that they could actually have, one could have a long position and a short position. So the fact that markets are correlated doesn't mean that trends are always going to be in the same direction. Now, yes, I will sort of say that uh, that uh, the best performance for trend followers often occurs when markets are highly correlated. So that means that many markets are moving in the same trend. And so you'll actually increase your exposure overall because of that high correlation. And those are also the times when you're going to see your maximum risk. So for example, is, is that you could be trading uh, a number of different global bonds futures. So this is that you're going to make your most money if all uh, global bond futures are moving in the same direction because there won't be any canceling out effect. At the same time, is, is, is that, uh, and that's because they're usually going to be highly correlated. At the same time, your, your risk is going to increase when all those trends are moving in the same direction at the same time. Yes, completely agree with all of that. I just want to make sure also, Brett, that you're aware of, of course, the conversations that I've had with Jerry from time to time where he also uh, kind of uh, mentions this, but where we also agree that sometimes, and we are hunting for outliers, let's not forget that, and sometimes we get these outliers where one seemingly highly correlated market with everyone you know everything else in your port in your sector just takes off and goes much much further than anything else in the same sector so that's also something you need to be aware of which is why i think in a sense that when it comes to following the the, the actual signal treating them individually is very important because they could really run for for much further than maybe some of the other markets in the same sector and I would also comment it is, is that when generally there are rules of thumb that people use when they talk about uh, you know, f futures trading. So they'll say, okay, I, I do bond trading, I'll do equity indices, and then I'll say, I have a exposure to commodities. And they lump all commodities together. Whether you look at correlations or not, what you find out is commodities are not the same. And so oftentimes when they're, they're thrown in as this, this broad generalization, I trade the commodity exposure. And reality that they're surprisingly uncorrelated and they don't move together. So now base metals may move together, precious metals may move together. But, a lot, uh, but one of the great values of commodity trading is the fact that commodities are not as highly correlated as what most people think. Yeah, no, I uh, completely agree. All right, let's move on with Brett's second question here. If you're only risking 50 basis point or whatever on a certain trade, that risk can really add up if you have on, say, 10 equity indices that are most likely highly correlated. Your risk to stop for the whole portfolio will keep your risk in check by limiting it to, say, 12% or whatever on all positions. But do you try to have a max risk per type of asset class or does that not matter? So just to answer that on my side, Brett, no, once I've decided on the portfolio that I want to trade, I don't currently put a cap on, say, the max risk to stop. I think you could potentially say, okay, if it gets to 20%, maybe you would do want to put a cap, but then you would have to adjust all positions in your portfolio accordingly. I don't know if there's any value in 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 doing that, but but you you could. I think it's more to do when you say, yeah, you could have ten equity markets that are highly correlated. Yeah, but then just choose eight if you're worried about that. Don't you know? So, or you could say, okay, I have these fifty markets, and if I look at my my uh, risk instead of taking fifty basis points on the whole portfolio per trade, let me just take forty basis points, 
and then I'm in I'm in a comfortable situation. I think those are the ways I would look to kind of just resolve the issue of having too much risk on, and always be aware that if you do a back test and you see what 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 drawdowns you would have incurred using a certain level of of risk per trade, you should always expect that to be higher in real time and going forward. So that's how I would would look at that. Um, anything you want to add, Mark? No, I agree. And this actually uh, moves back to the first part of the question is this is that if you're trading 12 global equity indices, is this that you have to expect that there or your maximum risk is the fact is what happens if all 12 of them are are, are trending in the same direction? what happens to your overall risk. So so you should account for the fact is that what happens if the directional risk all uh, moves in the same as your maximum exposure. And I think this is the reason why a lot of trend followers have, you know, relatively low margin to equity ratio because they could have a situation where markets uh, that they're trading a lot of markets within the same category and then they all start to take the same position. And then your risk could actually increase significantly. But those are also times of maximum gain. And so this is the classic problem with trend followers versus, you know, we'll call it uh, traditional portfolio managers. The trend follower would say is, is that if I'm trading, let's say, 10 global stock indices and all 10 of them have a long trend, I want to be in all those markets and I want to take the maximum exposure the market trends are telling me exactly what to do. The traditional manager might say, oh my God, I have too much exposure in equities. I'm going to have to sort of cut back my exposure. So at the exact time when you might have your maximum potential gain, you're, you're taking exposure off the table. And a trend follower's view is that, that that's exactly what you don't want to do. Yeah. <laughs> Vol targeting is, is right. it's, it's a it's lot the, of people... <laughs> It's Look the micro. Uh, uh, it's the micro uh, behavior of vol targeting. You talk about vol. Vol targeting seems to make perfect sense, and and I I do it at the portfolio level because you want to have some. You want to be able to talk to clients and be able to say this is what you should expect from what we're doing. At the same time, on a micro level, what you're doing is you're going to have to then start to uh, that you might be taking. You might have similar positions across many markets that all might be working and you're going to have to take exposure off the table. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right, let's uh, do the last bit of the question and then we get into um, the big study. And Brett writes, since there are way more currency pairs out there to trade than soft commodities, your portfolio natural will have more exposure to currency moves since statistically you have a better chance of having one more currency position in the book. In theory, that means every position isn't equally weighted since the sector slash asset type will be skewed in one direction depending on how many you have in the book. Sorry to be long-winded, but hopefully my questions make sense. Yeah, no, absolutely, Brett. I think they're good questions. I think they're important. So let me deal with that as well. You're absolutely right. There are more currency uh, pairs out there than there are soft commodities, but it doesn't mean you have to trade all the currency pairs out there, right? I think you need to choose a number of currencies that you think are somewhat different. I mean, there's no need. If, I mean, if you were just choosing two and you chose the euro and the Swiss, it's pretty much the same thing, more or less. So you wouldn't want that, but you might want to change, take the you know Australian dollar instead or the yen to get some kind of diversification so yes, you again think about the total number of currency markets you want to trade, and and maybe maybe let, let me back up uh, one second. The first thing I think you should think of if you look at your portfolio is to say, okay, how many markets do I can I realistically trade, taking you know in, into consideration my risk budget, my account size, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Once you've determined that, and let's just say for argument's sake that that number is twenty, then I think you need to decide between uh, you know with yourself and say, okay how much allocation do I want to commodities and how much do I want to financials? Then you divide the pie in whatever relationship you want that to be in. And then once you have that, then you can say within my financial part, how many, how much should be currencies? How much should be fixed income? How much should be short-term interest rates? How much should be equities? That's your financials. And then you look at your commodities and you say, okay, how much should be base metals? How much should be precious metals? you know, softs, grains, um, energy, all of that good stuff, meats, um, for that matter, you know, maybe you want some crypto, I don't know. But I think just keep it simple, 
And once you have that and you have your 20 markets, you've selected them, then you can decide on your risk per trade and then you can run your simulation and see how it went. It's not going to be like that in the future, but it gives you an idea of the profile. Let's put it that way. Profile of the portfolio. Look at your average wins. Look at your average losses. There needs to be certainly a good ratio, ratio between those. Look at your drawdowns. Make Take into account it will be bigger in the future. Can you stomach that? Things like that. I would just say keep it simple at that stage. I will just add to the previous question that I'm very familiar with firms that, since I work for one, that does risk, that does run a, an overall risk budget, meaning there are certain limits that we will, don't want to go above on a daily basis for the full portfolio. So we don't target volatility, but we do have a risk budget, a, a maximum risk budget. Now, that budget can change on a daily basis. That's one of the dynamic features of our risk management system. It can change, but there is a budget. And I think that's the important part to know that you have some certain boundaries uh, that you follow. And then, of course, you need to be familiar with the, what controls that that those boundaries. Anyway, Mark, anything you want to add before we dive into your big uh, topic here? No, I think you covered it. Uh, but we're going to discuss this a little bit in, when we talk about due diligence is that portfolio construction mm -hmm. is one of the most important features that investors want to understand from managers. And I think we're touching on that key issue is that, it, you know, I think a lot of managers in trend following world, they'll, they'll talk about, well, here's my, uh, I don't want to say they'll t talk about the secret sauce, but they'll say, here's what I do for trend following. Here's how I look at a market. Here's when I enter and exit, which are all very important, but a key component from an investor's point of view is how do you construct the portfolio? How do you take, uh, we, we want to know how you look at one market, but when you have trade 50 markets, how are all those integrated into a system? And this is the issue that, uh, that is, uh, is of most importance to investors. Oh, couldn't, couldn't agree more. Portfolio construction is actually one of those things that people don't think enough about, but actually it's critical to uh, long-term success in this business. Now, I've teased enough about it, but today we are going to talk about a topic that I find really interesting. In, in a sense, I've been dealing with this for 30 years because I've always been on the client-facing side of this industry. So now to have a paper, and I will say it's not public yet, so you're getting a sneak preview, which is absolutely fantastic that Mark has been able to uh, help us with. He's one of the uh, two authors of the paper, so of course uh, he has uh, good connections there. But but it is wonderful to have this paper to uh, to discuss um, because it's the study that Mark did with the Kaya Association. I think you're going to find it really interesting, um, even if you're not a manager or an investor in hedge funds today, uh, simply because the topics are what are the key drivers for manager selection. And I think we can all learn a lot about that when we dig into this. I think before we dive into all the sub headlines that the, the paper covers, I would like maybe for you, Mark, to kind of set the stage, the background story a little bit as to how this came about. When was it done? You know, maybe we talk a little bit about how many people participated in it, so on and so just to set the stage before we go into some of the the findings. Let's first talk about due diligence in general. And I, I call this the black hole of investing because it's not often discussed. Uh, there's not a lot of research from academics. And the practical work of due diligence is not always testable. And so let's look at the, uh, the sort of the classic way to view it or, or how an academic would view it or a quant would view it. Uh, they would sort of say, find a list of managers, uh, sort them according to what is the sharp ratio and uh, or return or some, you know, quantitative factor and go out and just buy the ones at the top. And, you know, this is a search problem and it's a quantitative problem or that's the way that academics would view this. Then you go into the practical world and always in the back of your mind and on the bottom of a lot of uh, is the disclaimer, past performance is not indicative of future success. 
So all of a sudden that, that you're warned that you should not use all of the quantitative tools that you just use to search to find the managers. And then also what you find out is, and I've been on both the buy and sell side, you know, working for managers and then also doing allocations. And I always sort of have this view that financial products are not, uh, uh, you know, bought, they're actually sold. What I mean by that, if you're bought, then, then the buyer would just sort of look for his criteria and choose choose managers. And so in, a, in an efficient market world, those people who are the best managers should see all the, all the money move to them and all the poor managers should be out of business. But in reality, what you find out that there, there has to be something else going on that affects how people make decisions. And this is the basis of what we're trying to get at, at the, uh, at the survey. And so I actually went to Kaya and I said, you know, as the, uh, chartered alternative investment, alternative investment association. You want to be able to sort of say this is that for both your readers and for members. Said, how do people go about this due diligence, and and how do they actually make decisions? Uh, because I see that there's this big disconnect, and the disconnect is is, is that uh, most work is done by quants, but most of the discussion about managers is qualitative. And, and Niels, you you probably have have gone into meetings. Is this is that they'll look at the numbers, but then most of the questioning is qualitative of like, what do you do? How do you do it? Tell me about the uh, about what's going on inside the firm. Tell me how you make decisions. It's not quantitative. It's a more of how to it. And the second issue is is that you find this is is that uh, uh, there's a tremendous amount of focus in the due diligence process operational or business risk. This is especially post Madoff. You think that uh, we have all of these tables that report performance, yet when you look at due diligence, a lot of time is spent on just looking at operational issues. So what is the business risk? So it doesn't matter if you make an extra couple hundred basis points in return, if there's a risk that you could be going out of business and I'm going to have to do that workout, I may not invest with you. So given these disconnects, given this black hole, you know, I went to Kaya, I said, look, this might be an interesting survey. So I work with Black over at, at Kaya. They developed a sort of a set of surveys. And we went out and we surveyed the membership, but we asked them only if you're involved in the due diligence process. And we broke it up into two parts. We asked uh, first to have a survey for investors and then a survey for the managers. And the reason why we wanted to look at both components is because we wanted to find out whether there is a perception of difference between how an investor looks at due diligence versus how the manager looks at due diligence. So again, we focused on asked only people who are actually involved in the process we got uh, a wide variety of both large firms, small firms, family office, pensions, CIOs, analysts, people who work on the operational side, people who work on the investment side. So we think we got a good sample of people who are involved in this decision process. And we were able to sort of get a good handle on how this is actually done and how people go through the, uh, through the process. And what we find is, is that there's actually a sort of two major components or two, two parts to due diligence. One is the investment side, which, you know, I think that uh, for your listeners, that's what we often talk about on this podcast is, is that how, how are investment decisions made? But there's a second part is what is the operational uh, or business risk associated with uh, the firm? So, uh, because if you're investing in a management company or investing with a manager, what you're actually doing is investing in their business. And so the question is, can they execute on the investment style or thesis that they're actually bringing to the in investor? And what you find out is, is, is that uh, uh, in the investment side, it's actually a combination of both quantitative and qualitative 
and a, and this operational business risk oftentimes has veto power over the in, uh, investment side. So we tried to get at is is that how difficult is it to do uh, due diligence on alternative investors, and what we find that people find that doing uh, analysis on traditional managers is is actually fairly easy they're well-known benchmarks so uh, if you if you're an equity long only manager you could find uh, let's say the s p benchmark you if you're a small cap you could use let's say a russell 2000 um, given regulatory environment there's a fair amount of transparency and what happens is is that uh, you can get to know the manager through databases. So surprisingly, traditional management, both on fixed income and equity, is fairly quantitative, is fairly easy, because there's transparency and benchmarking that allows you to determine how to choose a manager. On the other hand, alternative investments is much more difficult, given the fact that there's not the same level of transparency and there's not the same type of benchmarking. So I think that gives you a little bit of, uh, of uh, maybe an overview of what we are trying to, uh, to, to look at. Uh, but we could now talk about a little bit more specific of so how is this done? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, as I said, I thought it was fascinating because you're absolutely right. This kind of study, I don't think it's ever really been done to try and dig deep into what really is important to an investor in terms of when they make that decision but also how that differs from perhaps how the manager sees it, which is quite interesting. Uh, I think it was really good that you made that comparison because I do think we as managers have a different perspective on these things. And it's kind of funny. This is about due diligence to to a large extent, right? And it just reminds me that um, one of the reasons for me to, to starting the podcast all those years ago was really because I felt at the time rightly or wrongly, that I could ask better questions of managers than the people coming in from the outside having to do due diligence on on, uh, on 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 managers like a trend follower and so on and so forth. I'm not sure whether I succeeded in that, um, but that was actually one of my key motivations because I thought at the time that everybody was asking us the same questions. They were all using the AIMA due diligence questionnaire at that point, and you kind of always were asked the same questions. So uh, anyways... Just a little anecdote from from that. <laughs> you touch on a very interesting issue, and um, you know, I we end with sort of like the disconnects between managers and investors. But you touched on one of the disconnects is that most of the managers think that the due diligence process should be easy. You know, they say, "Well, you know, I I know my field, I know trend following, so therefore, I expect that uh, they should see my value fairly easily <laughs> relative to other firms." And investors are generally generalists, so so they're they're not uh, specialists in managed futures, systematic investing. So they, uh, what you find as manager should be easy, they find fairly difficult. So that's a disconnect. That is a disconnect, and I actually fully appreciate that. I, you know, you know, I have, would have no idea how to go about doing due diligence on a on a you know credit manager or anything like that. So I completely agree with that but i've also as as you alluded to in the beginning i mean i've sat through you know hundreds if not more than a thousand of these due diligence meetings over the years and you do get surprised sometimes with the questions that you get where you just think why is that important i mean it's you know for example people would ask okay so what's the exact length of your moving average that you're using not that we are using moving average i mean things like that where you just think well whether it was 30 days or 40 days it doesn't doesn't really matter. So to speak, you're, you're pri- priding a little too much into the secret sauce. Anyways, let's leave my story, war stories and dig into your into your survey. I have a list of things that I kind of, and maybe, uh, I mean, I, I'll read them out because um, these were things that are topics. You can then say whether, you know, whether you have the answer uh, for it or, or we can jump over it. But I just want to make sure we cover a lot of these kind of interesting subheadings uh, from the survey so one of the first thing you that the survey talks about or tries to establish is a little bit about you know how long does it actually take to do these kind of due diligence because again 
I think managers might have a different perspective than investors in terms of how long these things actually take. So, uh, so I want to ask you about that, and also maybe you can talk a little bit about who actually decides then on the manager selection from the investor side. Sure, is that surprisingly is is that if you actually have a call and you're you know we'll sort of say that there's actually some presentation done that you're actually sharing some information with the manager. In most cases, say two over two thirds is a chance. It's, it's going to be done within you know zero to six months. That uh, you know th- there will be an um, you know sort of on site visit that's changed in the pandemic world. There'll be an operational due diligence, but generally that uh, and some might think that that's a very long process. But within uh, you know sort of zero to six months a decision will be made about most of the managers now sometimes it can draw uh, be drawn out for years but that's because there may not there may be a disconnect because they're waiting on information they're waiting on scheduling they may not be interested in your specific strategy at a given time so you're put on a back burner but I would sort of say that it happens uh, fairly quick. So, so if if you're not moving forward within six months, from a manager's perspective, it's probably not going to happen. Now, I will sort of say, and this is another one of the disconnects, is is that most managers think that the decision is made by an individual, and that's because they're usually interacting with one person uh, as a point person for their for their discussions. In reality, is that most investment decisions concerning managers and due diligence, it's done by a committee. And what you find is is that the committee process will have different interest groups. You know, one will be the analyst who's presenting to the committee. Uh, you'll have the CIO, uh, who is not going to be as quantitative. Is probably going to be much more qualitative focused. So, uh, so he's going to be wanting to know us is that. Tell me about the culture. Tell me about the manager. Tell me about, uh, you know, sort of the intangibles. And then you'll have the uh, operational guys. And uh, I'll sort of half joke is this is that the operational guys are the doctor no of investment decisions. And that in some in some cases, our survey shows that about one third of the time, you know, a rejection will be given to a manager, not because of the investment side, but but because of the operational people that doesn't pass operational due diligence. And so uh, this may be disheartening for smaller managers, but it's the, uh, you might have a great investment thesis, but again, it's an issue of whether you have the operational expertise to be able to run the money that'll often determine whether people will allocate to, to you or not. Just a quick comment on that, uh, that are just personal, uh, a, a sort of a personal view that I find interesting. I mean, I completely agree with what the survey has found. There's no surprise there. And I think you're right that most decisions nowadays are made by committee. What I find interesting about that, because I do think it's a little bit different from when I started in the industry. Often we would meet with the decision maker as well. There's always like right. one guy that kind of really took the decision. And if you could get in front of him or her and make a good impression, so to speak, the likelihood of 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 of, of something happening uh, would be much higher. So my, my concern is that when you now do all of these things by committee, and as you say, in reality, there may only be one person from that committee who've actually met the manager, met the team, et cetera, et cetera. My view is that what, to a large extent, investors are buying is people. You know, it's the people behind the firms. It, that's the important part. That's what they need to understand, how they think and and all of that. Plus, I do think, and, and this may sound silly, but I do think it also there also has to be a good chemistry between the people on the buy side and the sell side, so to speak, to have a good working relationship. So I find it a little bit concerning that nowadays that aspect is kind of lost uh, because it has to be funneled through. One individual has to explain to his committee, oh, you know, I think Jerry's a nice guy. This is how he is. This is what he, you know, or, you know, Moritz is he's great. You look at this. He's, you know, you lose that. I think when you when you do it. Um, and to me, that's that is a concern just a personal view oh 
Now, there is a, unfortunately, the, uh, well, I think you're touching on a really important issue because we'll sort of say that uh, when people think about the edge, they'll say that the one of the key factors that they call edge for an investor is experience, So, which is mm-hmm. a, a, a people issue. Uh, then it might be the you know, research pr- uh, process, but experience is, is one of the key edges that people have. Uh, that managers have. The other is, is is that on the qualitative side, one of the important issues is the integrity of the firm and an alignment of interests. And we'll say that you when know, you talk about integrity and alignment of interests, that's that's a very person specific. And I think I I'll agree that there probably twenty years ago there was uh, more of a portfolio manager who is making decisions so you can actually you know, go out and meet them they get to know you and and there was probably more relational decision making now i will sort of say from an integrity and culture issue this is that there's the old uh, story of that uh, that you know people would take uh managers or go out to uh to dinner or lunch with managers and then they would see exactly you know how they treated wait staff to determine uh, whether they're a person of integrity uh that that these are certain sort of intangibles but general it will sort of say that that there are qualitative features that help determine whether you would make a allocation to a manager that are not written down and cannot be measured through some quantitative factor yeah, and this actually goes into uh, so we asked the question: What are the factors that could predict future performance of a manager? So, because you want to sort of say like, well, you know, do you think that there's persistence in sharp ratio? Do you think are there certain things that you look at to try to sort of help you predict? Even though we know that uh, past performance is not indicative of future success, and they'll say uh, the respondents say that it was that qualitative factors were highly or most important in trying to predict the future. So in some sense, they say, I see the numbers, but I need to know the process and the person to be able to determine whether I think that they could make money in the future. Yeah, I think that makes sense. So uh, what we find out is, is that in general, is, is that there are huge differences in difficulty. Uh, and now some of this might seem obvious, but uh, I guess I'd sort of say that, uh, some of it is surprising. This is that now it was found, or we found that venture cap is the hardest to do a due diligence on because there's no benchmark, very little transparency. They might be doing some one off portfolios. So you really have to sort of make judgments about the management team and their ability to choose firms in a venture cap fund. So, and that seems obvious. But surprisingly, the number two hardest strategy was systematic. Number three was global macro. Then we had uh, private equity and then CTAs. So we, we listed all the different uh, strategies that you, uh, in alternative investment, you know, from real estate, long, short equity and such, and try to say, is it, well, tell us which one you find the most difficult to do versus what are the easiest. And surprisingly, not, or not surprising, traditional assets were the easiest. Uh, equity hedge funds were, you know, relatively easy because you could sort of say that if they're doing long, short investing, this is that, well, I understand how a traditional manager might make investment decisions. So let's, uh, so we're also now going to include how they run a short book. And so, and it seems easy to understand why venture capital might be so difficult. But surprisingly, is is that the systematic managers were were very difficult, even though they're they're very model driven, and they sort of say that they use more of a quantitative process. Still, about twenty percent of uh, or a fair amount of the decision of how to choose a manager is qualitative, even for systematic and trend following, and. The viewer, what we're uh, what we tried to tease out from the data was the fact that, okay, you can have the data and you can hear about the models, but you need to have someone tell you or walk you through the interpretation of what's being done, 
and the qualitative due diligence is based on, you know, sort of this assessment of walking through how a system works. And you can't extract that from just looking at numbers. You have to have someone right. tell you about it. You have to sort of talk about philosophy. You have to talk about uh, how portfolios are constructed. And as we talked earlier in, in the uh, the podcast today, is this is that the one thing that are, are is very important for manage uh, for for managers to explain to investors is what is portfolio uh, portfolio construction, risk management, and idea implementation. Those are almost equal in terms of what's important for the investment committee to understand from a qualitative perspective. This is that. And this is sort of the black box because you can see the return numbers, but you want to say, how did you get them? So what's the performance attribution and contribution? So you want to know the portfolio construction. How do you handle risk? And then idea implementation. To a lesser degree, they're also looking for when they look at your performance track records, they see the numbers that they're also looking for managers to explain outliers. So if you had a really bad month, you can rest assured that you're going to be asked, explain why you lost money in that month. And similarly, if you had a, a great month and it's, it seems out it's an outlier on the positive side, people are going to ask you, how did that occur or why did that occur? So those are things that are very, uh, very important in terms of, of what's, uh, what investors are looking at from a, uh, from a qualitative perspective. I'm just going to jump in here, Mark, just trying to sort of catch up on some of the topics that I also mentioned. But I, I want to go back to just seeing about, you know, the, the the people side of things. And 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 as as I said, I thought it's it's important that people actually meet the people and so on and so forth. But I can also think of one thing that is kind of a a challenge, because when you do it like that, when people come in to really meet with the team, so to speak. And especially kind of the research teams, the head of research uh, or the co-heads of research, whatever, however you have your group structured. Then it also becomes about, I, I think this is my, my, my assumption, I think, is that it actually also comes down to how do they come across? How good are they at, so quote unquote, presenting? I mean, and, and so I think that the challenge for the analyst or whoever meets them is to separate a little bit you know how they present because you can have and i've met some of the smartest people in the world but who may not come across so well when they have to do a presentation of things right they they can be a little bit distracted and and and, and nerdy and and whatever and then you have on the other side you have people who come across incredibly like and many of them have been on the podcast um uh, so so and i think that's can actually put some people at a disadvantage because they actually are really, really good, but they were never expecting that because they're good at math or physics or designing systems, that they also had to be good at making presentations, et cetera, et cetera. So I just think that that's a challenge that the analysts need to be aware of and try to kind of separate a little bit. You've actually touched on another paper that I actually wrote for the Journal of Alternative Investment it has not been published yet. And it's about uh, narrative and the investment process. And narrative or storytelling is critical to success in raising assets and success in explaining what you do to investors. And when I say narrative and storytelling is that your ability to weave an, uh, uh, for investors a story about how you can make money, how you've done it in the past, how you do it currently, and how this is going to continue in the future. And what are the environments you're going to do well? What are the environments that you're not going to do well? And then how do you actually go about your research to make sure that you're constantly improving yourself? And we'll sort of say that there's no question, for example, that Albert Einstein was a great physicist, but he was actually also a great storyteller. And all of science is associated with good storytelling. This is it. So, so uh, when, even if you, uh, 
read a journal article is, is that, well, you could just have a table of numbers and say, I ran these tests and these are the results. No, usually what happens is, is that there's a narrative about like, how does this fit in? Why is it important? What did you do that's unique? And so the same thing that's being done in science actually also applies in due diligence when you're um, when you're a manager. And this is the qualitative aspect uh, that that I think that the academic research or the idea of looking at just sharp ratio don't doesn't get at you. You sort of say, "I see your turns. I sh- see your sharp sharp rate ratio. You meet some minimum standards. Now I need to know how did you do it? Why are you able to make money? And why is this going to persist? And that's a narrative." And unfortunately, this is that if you're not good at telling the narrative, this is that it's going to be hard for you to be able to raise money. Now, surprisingly, you know, say marketing material and websites that the, we'll call it, and I put this in quote, the slickness of your materials is really not that important to investors. But your ability to articulate your risk management and research process or portfolio construction is very critical. And that's something that they can't get from the numbers. Yeah. And let me just expand on that. So I would go as far as this, that storytelling is not just important in science. Storytelling is important in all of human life, right? right. What's the first thing we, we do when we're babies? We're told stories. Our parents read to us every night when we fall asleep. So our brains, as far as I'm aware, and I'm not an complete expert here, but I think I've heard that our brains are somehow somehow wired to hear stories and that there are some quote-unquote filters that kind of goes down when we start hearing stories because that's really what we've been programmed for. And of course, what is history? History is stories, right? That's how we learn history. We These are stories. So so no no I mean narrative and we let's do that another time right. because that's a fascinating uh, topic uh, and I didn't know you had written another paper on that so I'm thrilled to hear that because I think this is something that we can all improve and be better at so let's do that I want to dive into one question um, and I don't know how far down you are in your list but one thing that surprised me a little bit from what I thought it would be the answer and that is external consultants how important are they because at least in my experience a lot of these institutional investors have been sur- have been surrounding themselves by consultants so it's been really hard to even get to the investor themselves because you had to go through the consultants and and so on and so forth i've actually did a um, i did a podcast episode a couple of a few years back now with three of the largest consultants in the world and so that that episode can be found. I think it's under the roundtable series. But I would love to hear your uh, what the, your survey found in terms of how important consultants are in this process. Right, uh, it's that's a very interesting answer we got to the question, and uh, and I was also surprised by that. It showed that consultants have uh, very little impact in the decision process, and that most of it is uh, internal generated and decisions and. I probably sort of say that for, uh, you know, government pension plans, consultants are very important. Uh, And for some other groups, you have to be, uh, let's sort of say, if you're in a RIA group, uh, so that they'll often, you know, use consultants at times, so that you have to be on the consultants uh, buy list to, to make any headway. The survey says that that's not the case. And I went deeper into the data and we'll probably sort of say that because most, uh, well, all the respondents who are Kaya members, they've been certified or they passed their Kaya test, uh, so they have some more experience in alternative investments. We'll probably sort of say that some of these are larger shops that it may have been a bias associated with the sample of who were we were surveying. But it says that generally that the consultants are n- not that important to the process. Now, I think that there's, you know, buy lists from consultants. I think that people use that list, but, you know, they'll also sort of talk with other managers. There may be a higher hurdle for you to pass 
to be able to get it over this consult, you know, not being on a consultant list, but that even if you're on the consultant list, there is still a committee that's making that decision and, and it's not the consultant that's driving the ultimate decision. To be very transparent, I, I have kind of a love-hate relationship with consultants. Everybody and does. It's more about <laughs> <laughs> Okay, fair enough. And I think it's more about the process because what I've experienced in, in, in my career, at least, is that you are often told by the investor, oh, yeah, but you have to go through the consultant. And the consultant then has this approved list, right? And the only way you can get on the approved list is, is if they would even do a review of, of your firm. And I know for a fact that some consultants, even though our firm has been around for 47 years, some firms have not done a review on, on our firm for more than a decade. And when, when I ask about it, so why don't you come and do a, a you know a, a review? I mean, after all, we've been around for a while. They say, oh yeah, but um, we only do reviews if we have enough of our underlying clients request a review of you as a manager. And I just think, well, well, that's kind of crazy because isn't it your job to present interesting managers? I mean, if the investors were to identify us as an interesting manager, they don't need a consultant in the first place. And and furthermore, since we don't know who their clients are, it's very hard for us to go and say, well, couldn't you ask for a review of us so that we can start having a, a, a proper conversation? And I worry, and this is kind of back to uh, some of the risks that I generally see in, in, in uh, not just in our industry, but in the whole world, and that is you end up, and, and I guess the AUM numbers of our industry uh, suggest that, you end up with hyper concentration among the largest managers. The few managers who attract all the assets is, is because they are on the approved list so that all the institutions, the really large allocators, might only be able to choose from five or ten managers in the world so they get all the allocations. And you miss out a lot of the, on, on a lot of the talent who falls outside of that. That's my that's my concern. And that is also why it's a little bit frustrating now to hear from your survey that actually investors don't put too much, you know, weight on the consultants. Well, okay, well, if that's the case, why should they, you know, have this important role as gatekeepers and 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 disallowing invest or managers to have direct uh, contact with with the uh, investors? Anyways, that's a little bit of a well, personal. No, this is rant. an important issue because I, I think okay. that. Uh, I, I would like to tease out more of this. And one thing we weren't able to do with this, we did a survey, but you know, a survey is a tease. It doesn't get at the heart of the issue is that you'd like to also do interviews with, with people too, to sort of tease out more of that and sort of a, this is not my full-time job. This is sort of a labor of love. Uh, so I guess I'd sort of say that, that, that would be an interesting area for further discussion, but the one thing I found out is, is that when you look at, for example, is that what disqualifies managers? And so mm -hmm. most important are return, risk, and experience. The, so, so if you don't have good returns, the, 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 that, that'll be a disqualifier. If you're, if you're too risky relative to their targets, that, that'll be a disqualifier. And now, surprisingly, the third most important disqualifier is just experience. They're looking for you know managers that have had a strong level of experience and sort of say that they they've been through a number of different market cycles. Now, the th things that are not important for disqualification are fees, fund terms, and size. And so, uh, so most of the investors say that size doesn't really matter. We ask also what uh, what really matters is is it, and I found this sort of interesting and also I'd like to tease this out more is that, that growth matters, which suggests that there is a bandwagon effect with investors so that, you know, if it doesn't matter whether if you're a big or small firm, but if let's say you're growing very fast and so there's a lot of assets coming into in the door for you, then then all of a sudden that that causes a lot more interest with investors. So they say like, well, if if other if my peers are investing in a manager, well, I want to also at least take a look at him, and I might invest with him. And so there is this seem, seems to be a bandwagon effect. Now, even for uh, emerging managers, size doesn't seem to be a key determinant, at least from the survey participants. But it, what but what will 
does matter is sort of the quality of operations or business risk. So, so I think for a lot of the smaller managers, they say, well, how do I get to be a larger manager? And I'll probably sort of say it's, it's not so much uh, if you've got good returns, if you're, you know, controlled risk, you have a good story or have some experience, it's, uh, it's quality of operations that matters. So, so, and that's something that I think that uh, when you look at the disconnects, managers don't sort of put as much a higher value on that operational issues. I just want to intersect something here. I'm not so sure I truly agree with that statement that size doesn't matter uh, when it comes to investors because I cannot count how many times I've heard the argument from investors saying, I'm not really going to look at you because you're, you're totally you it might actually be okay, but the fund that I need to invest in, I don't want to be more than 10% of that. So I can't invest because it's only $50 million and I want to give you $50 million if I'm going to invest. So I think size really does matter for institutional investors. Um, Maybe not for a family office, but once you're an institution, I really feel that size matters. Uh, And also the other thing, and I agree with the the importance of of operational qualifications and, and, and all of that stuff, but... The other thing I have found is that I think the reason why size matters in reality, and that is that people, investors, analysts, they don't want to take the career risk of having suggested a small manager, right? We used to joke by saying, oh, yeah, you know, you're never going to get fired by investing with Winton, right? Because they're like the brand name of of CTAs, right? But you might get, you might get, uh, you, you know, fired if you invest with a small manager, so I, I actually will say, from for me, that part of the survey I don't think fits so well with my uh, practical experience with investors. And, and I think that the, the, this becomes complex in being able to tease out. So, so one of the key determinants of of edge is experience. So if you're a new manager and you don't have experience because you haven't worked at a large shop. And, and what, you know, for example, next to years of work as measures of experience is what was your past employers. So if let's say that you've worked in a uh, asset management area or in trading for, you know, 15 years and you're coming from Goldman Sachs and you're a small, a quote unquote, starting out as a small manager, you probably will get over these hurdles. If you're a uh, junior person who's in is still in his late 20s doesn't have a lot of experience uh doesn't have a pedigree in terms of coming from a a strong past employer uh, then it's going to be much harder now i hear you on on the size issue i would sort of say that especially with erisa you, you there's limits to how much you can be in a given fund another way to view this is is that instead of using the word size I would sort of say that you have to show that there's economies of scale, that you're scalable. And scalable means this is that uh, you still have to meet operational due diligence. And I go back to this again and again, because what happens is that the operational due diligence will have their own separate checklist or qualitative measures. And what they're going to do is is they're going to sort of say that I don't care if you're a hundred million dollar or fifty million dollar firm or a billion dollar firm. This is what we expect from an operational due diligence. This is where we have to have division of of responsibilities. We have to have uh, you have to have uh, a back office. You have to have redundancy in systems. And the small managers, because of the economies of scale, they just don't have the ability to be able to do that. So they get disqualified. So people say, well, it's not a size issue, but what happens is that we're not going to cut you any slack on operational due diligence. And that means is that if you don't have a certain size, you can't be able to meet their criteria and you're going to be dropped out. Yeah, no, I agree with that as well. That 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 is certainly uh, one another filter. I will also, before we maybe we wrap up with some of your last points you want to highlight, but I will say another thing. Uh, when you t- said before that one of the least important uh, dis- uh, criteria is fees, I didn't I didn't react to it internally when I heard that. I thought, okay, that's interesting. But then I realized, hmm, my 
experience, and this is in Europe, of course, but the way things have changed over here nowadays is that one of the key important criteria for investors is something called total expense ratio. So if they make an investment, they actually, I think there are laws now or rules for a lot of types of investors where they have a certain budget of expenses that they can spend. So if they choose a really low cost manager, uh, and, and it's not just the manager's fees, it's actually including the expenses of the fund, which is why, again, big funds have low expenses because there are more assets to to pay for them. So they have this budget. And so if you have too high expenses as a manager and, and with your fund vehicle, they may simply not be able to invest with that because it ruins their total exp- total expense ratio that they have to stay within. So... So that's another thing where I feel my practical experience doesn't fully tie in with fees are not so important. I think actually it's one of the most important things for many investors nowadays in Europe is, okay, so where do you come in on the total expense ratio before we go any further, right? I probably would sort of say that, uh, and I look at the geographical breakdown of the survey participants, majority are still in the US, so so that may not have been captured. I think that the way you view it is, is you say like, well, what are, uh, when we looked at this, is that what disqualifies managers? And in some sense, this is that let's assume that you have quote unquote high fees. That's not a uh, disqualifier if let's say that your, uh, your, your actual returns are still very high. The way I interpret the results that we have is this, is that, that you got to generate returns. If you uh, generate, if you don't generate returns, you say like, well, but I'm cheaper than everybody else. That doesn't matter. And so, so you think about this: is is that uh, the difference between uh, you know, you know, two and twenty and one in twenty? If you're a, and you break that down into how much perform, uh, what it's costing you in performance on a month-to-month basis, it's actually pretty small. It's under 10, 10 basis points. Okay, so would you? Uh, uh, that's not a key criteria for determining whether you'll invest in a manager. You're first going to look at what's the return risk and experience. And then, then you might look at fees. So the negotiation of fees only comes after the, after you meet this other criteria. If, you, if you're not a good manager, it doesn't matter whether you're going to sort of give you a discount or you're a low fee manager. No, I think, I mean, it really should be like that. That is really about the net return, right? I mean, you can have someone like Renaissance Technologies that charges, I don't know, 5 and 46, and they still make, I don't right. know, 40% net return. So you would think that that's a great manager, but I can assure you, if even if now it's obviously closed and it's own partner's money and all of that stuff, but even if it was opened and you were trying to wrap that into a usage fund, I would say most investors couldn't buy it because the fees that's going to show up on their total return calculation is just so absurdly high that you know the regulation although the rules they have to stay within wouldn't allow it so anyways let's wrap up with the last few points that you want to uh, highlight there are so many things and of course as i said this is really a, a really lovely sneak preview because uh, the the uh, this study doesn't come out for a few months so what were the most surprised maybe i could just ask you about that what, what were some of the, the most surprising things that we haven't covered yet um that you found and also i want to ask you specifically if you did uh, i mean i read the survey as well i want to ask you about esg as well what investors said about that so esg first this is that really isn't at least in the alternative investment area that really hasn't isn't that important at this particular point i think that probably even since i've done the survey which is last year that we last fall that we were actually sort of you know collecting data and such i probably would sort of say that it's become more important with alternative is mm. as more people have invested esg in indices for their core portfolio now they're looking at how do i increase my esg exposure through my alternatives so i think it's becoming more important at the time we'll sort of say it's less important so yeah. now overall what were the surprises no, no, I can sort of say, and I put that in quotes because I, I sort of expected it, but I also sort of was verified. This is that as a quant, 
I probably sort of say that, yeah, this is a very, this should be a very cut and dry decision. And I'll sort of say that the survey suggests that qualitative does matter. Okay. That I su suspected that I always knew that, but this probably measures it and tells it this is that, you know, that uh, there's almost an equal value between operational due diligence, qualitative assessment, and quantitative, that, that there's this, those are the three areas. Within the qualitative is, is, is that culture matters, and that means is that your integrity, your alignment of interest, your communication matters. The other thing that, that I think that people don't put as much emphasis is, is, that, uh, is that team matters. It's a team effort that, the, uh, that investors are often look at, looking at. It's not a single person. They're looking at how do you integrate with a team? How do you work as a team? And how does that experience translate into in investment ideas? So, so I think that culture, team, qualitative assessment, your ability to articulate your story and be, uh, are all more important than just the numbers. And finally, I guess I'd sort of say that on benchmarking is, is, is that what, you know, I think most managers show, okay, how do I compare against the S&P 500? How do I compare against, uh, you know, uh, fit within a portfolio? Survey says this is that they're just looking at peer groups and, and we'll sort of say that the more sophisticated managers have customized peer groups. So this is a competition and it's a competition against your peers and you're constantly being assessed not against how you do against a traditional investment but how do you do versus other managers that are similar in style to you this is it so if you don't think this is a competitive market think again you're constantly being assessed versus your peer group yes no that very interesting indeed one thing that another takeaway that i had from the survey that i thought was quite interesting and that is that a lot of people responded that word of mouth and referrals are the best way for them to find managers and actually that capital introductions from prime brokers is not an important source of finding managers. I thought that was quite interesting, yeah. <laughs> just the way the, the industry is built. That could be another whole podcast is that you're railing against uh, consultants. This is that probably managers could have, say the, the same thing about cap introduction. <laughs> Yes, indeed. No, I'm you, I'm sure we're going to come back to this. this is great. I mean, the, now we have a foundation to kind of work from. I'm sure there will be more things. I might actually, I think it will be interesting. And I'll put that out as a little challenge to all our co-hosts at the podcast uh, to hear some of their views, experiences, to see if they agree with, with the uh, findings of the survey. The other thing I want to maybe to finish off with is just to ask you a little bit about whether you think, I mean, I... I I feel that the due diligence process per se, I mean, it's evolved, of course, but I don't think it's evolved that much. If, if, if I think about how it's done, the questions we get asked, et cetera, et cetera. And, I, and this is where I find it interesting. So if, if we can agree to some extent that one of the really, really important bits that investors invest in when they pick a manager is the people behind the manager right it's the it's really people they're picking to a large extent even if it's a systematic manager it's the people behind the systems that they're picking right? absolutely so so my my thought here is thinking a little bit out loud here is why isn't there kind of a set of questions that are more behavioral why are we not asking more behavioral questions because we're trying to identify the right people and people we know that behavioral is, is very important when you want to kind of assess a, a person. So maybe it's a facet for, for you, Mark, to take on and, and develop a new kind of questionnaire for doing due diligence. But I actually find that behavioral questions must be important somehow. I'm not sure how, but somehow they should be important when you're trying to pick good people. Am I wrong here? No, I, I think that, uh, well, I guess the integration of behavioral finance with uh, manager behavior and how that can be uh, teased out by investors is seems to, would be a very interesting uh, topic for f further research. Now, I will sort of say, and you sort of say, how is it, how has it changed? Uh, and, you know, as we both agree, I think it's people related. 
I will sort of say that as investors become more and more educated, whether it's through, uh, you know, Kaya, CFA, MBAs, you know, their educational level is, is that the threshold of what you have to provide to investors and how you and the depth of analysis that is done on managers is much stronger than what it was five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And so there is a, I don't want to say an arms race, but the level of sophistication on the investor side is higher so that it requires more transparency on the part of managers to explain what they do because investors demand it. I think that's true. Although I also think that there is a, there should be a, a, a kind of a line in the sand where managers should be allowed to say, you know, I really can't go into this level of details because it's kind of part of my IP, so to speak. But I will, I want to say one more thing about this before we leave today, because you brought up a good thing, an interesting point. And it, as you said, as more and more of the institutional investors are filling up their research areas with people with a Kaya uh, designation, an MBA or whatever, whatever, Here's the thought, and I don't mean to thrash these designations. These are difficult studies, et cetera, et cetera. Or, you know, I don't have any of those accreditations, so I, you know, but, but I, I, I'm pretty sure they're pretty difficult to get. My worry is, though, that we see the same kind of thinking. They've read the same books, they're taking the same exams. Now they have the same kind of thinking in all of these places, right? So my, my concern is always, how do we start to think differently if everyone is reading the same book? That, because I do think that that's also important in the research areas of, of, a, uh, of a systematic manager or any manager. You need to bring in different perspectives, different ways of looking at things. If we were, and, and this is why, and again, I don't, I don't want to sound critical as it's, it's a really bad idea, but, but you know, there are managers who, as part of their marketing, they'll say, oh yeah, but we're associated with this university, so we have all this collaboration, we're getting all of these people in. That is true, and, and I'm not saying it's not valuable, but what I'm just saying also is that, yes, but it could also be a little bit of a danger because you're, you're sourcing all your ideas from the same source, and then you get them in and you mold them thinking the way you think instead of trying to get people in who have complete diverse kind of thinking to try and actually move the needle. Is this completely crazy? Oh, no, no, no. Crazy? This is another topic that we could spend an hour on because, uh, <laughs> and, and I think the perfect example is, this is that, uh, and, uh, you know, let's, let's talk about the elephant in a room. This is, is that, let's say, the old traditional trend followers, like, you know, and, and those would be, you know, turtles, you know, d done. The language that they use is sort of Jerry uses to explain his portfolio versus the language that someone who has a CFA, an MBA, or a Kaya is very different. And so what happens is that there's a disconnect in how he would explain what he does versus someone who's been trained at a major university and he uses sort of, uh, I do... Uh, alternative risk premium factor investing and here's the factors i look at and and everybody's nodding their head because they learned that from their kaya test or they learned that from their mba class and so so that makes sense and then jerry comes in or you know let's say someone from dunn comes in or you know we'll sort of say back from uh, if john henry came in and then they start talking about well here's how i built my system here's how i think about markets here's what i do and you know like i don't put as much you know focus on perhaps correlation because this is how what i've learned from the markets given my experience that that's actually discounted because you do have people thinking the same way and they use a certain language mm. if you come in and you speak a different language or describe a process that's in a different language than what people are used to it's harder to overcome that you know that is actually a great way of explaining that and i actually think I actually think that that might be one of the reasons why we saw, at least for a time, maybe still, that some of the old style, and these were mainly US-based managers with the longest track records in, in, in the industry, so the most experience, not growing nearly as fast as 
a lot of the scientific managers that came in later, uh, a lot of them from Europe, uh, using, as you rightly say, they came from it with a different set of language, a different ways of explaining it. And frankly, they were incredibly successful in, in building their businesses and raising the assets. And now that you say it, it kind of makes sense. Maybe they were just speaking exactly the same language as the people sitting on the other side, making the investment decisions. And as simple as it may sound, could be a reason why we saw that shift in gear in terms of where all the AUM went. I think you're absolutely right on that. Right. And and I think that if if you are an outsider in terms of that you don't use the language of what is being taught in MBA schools today, it is going to be harder to raise money. So, uh, so you have to actually reconvert what you do into their language if you want to be successful. And, and, uh, and I think that that's, that, that is a whole process in, uh, of, of true iconoclasts are fine, will have it more difficult. And that's even, if, for example, if I could go into high-frequency trading, high-frequency traders you know, look, to have a very different view of how they look at the world than you know, say a traditional portfolio manager. And if that's the case, this is that uh, then you could sort of say their language is different, how they think about risk, a multi-strat guy. So if let's say, you know, a millennium or whatever, how they sort of construct a portfolio is very different than how a traditional guy would look at it. In some cases, they might have difficulty because the investor who's been trained a certain way wants to put you in a certain box. If you don't fit the box, then they have a problem and they can't invest. Yeah. No, absolutely. Let's leave it for now here on this topic. I think this was amazing. I hope that people really took a lot of notes. I thought your survey and the work you've done with Kaya is fantastic. I think it's going to be a great contribution to the conversation. I can't wait to get into the next paper you've done about narrative and investing. Obviously, Robert Schiller wrote a book called, I think, Narrative Investing. Uh, so that, you know, there, there is definitely a lot to it. It's something that I truly believe in. So, uh, yeah, definitely something that would be uh, good to spend some time on. Um, but you need to give me uh, advance notice, Mark, if I have to read <laughs> up like I had to read up for this this weekend's uh, recording because it was a, certainly a, a good chunk of, of uh, content to catch up on. Now, let's go to the performance of uh, where the industry is. Now, the numbers I'm going to quote is as, as of Thursday night. Friday was not a good day, as far as I can tell, for for a lot of inve for a lot of trend followers. So I think the numbers are not nearly well; they're not as positive as they are right now. But right now, as of Thursday, CTAs are still doing pretty well. Frankly, uh, beta fifty up one point two percent, up almost nine percent for the year. CTA stock, stock gen CTA index up one percent, up seven point six percent for the year. Trend index almost up two percent for the month up 10.5% for the year. Short-term traders index, as we talked about last week, they're down for the month, 0.4, and they're actually also now down for the, for the year, 0.2. So there's definitely a, a change. My trend barometer, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's, it's weak. It's at level 36. It's been stuck in that lower bound range for a while. Something that corresponds more with, with the returns we've seen on our side at Dawn for the last three months. But the industry has kind of coped overall. So there is obviously some differences in that and uh, MSCI world index for a change is actually down for the for the month uh, down 1.4% still up 15 for the year and the government bonds they got uh, sold off uh, this uh, week uh, and therefore this month it's down 36 basis points next week i'm joined by richard he's back so this will definitely be very fun and another i'm sure educational masterclass from him Talking about speaking a different language, he has a different way of explaining trend following compared to uh, some of us, and it's really useful, really helpful. And so I can't uh, wait until we get on to another episode to talk about trend following from the perspective of down under. So make sure you send the questions in as you normally do. Um, we, we think it's really fun to uh, answer those questions that you send in. So info at toptradersonplug.com, that's the best place for you to send them. And also, as I said in the beginning, if I could ask you to do us a big favor this week, take a few minutes out and use the link toptradersonplot.com forward slash share. Send that link to three like-minded friends or family members, colleagues, whatever it might be, and let's see if we can't get them in involved uh, in the conversation and in the podcast 
that would be absolutely incredible. And I will keep an eye on the numbers to see whether I see a difference. So uh, I'm making you a little bit accountable on that side. Anyways, I can't thank Mark enough for uh, you know preparing this study and allowing us to give you a sneak preview. So from Mark and me, thanks ever so much for listening. We look forward to being back with you next week. Until next time, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.